Family Mode. Good afternoon. My name is Becky Robinson. I'm the founder and CEO of Weaving Influence, and I'm here today with Jennifer Conweiler, and we are so excited to have a conversation with you today. Hi, Jennifer. Hey, Becky. Hi, everybody. I'm going to introduce Jennifer in a moment, but while we're waiting for a few more people to arrive, we want to help you get acquainted with GoToWebinar, and I'd love to have you try out the question panel, where we'll be taking questions throughout the event. What I'd like to ask you to do now is to find the question panel and tell us where you're calling in from today. I am calling in from my home office in the state of Michigan, um, and Jennifer is calling in from her home office, from, and yeah, tell us where hot, that is. Hot Lancer, hot Lancer. we're having a, a cool freeze right now with 90s instead of 100, Becky. Wow, well it looks like we have almost every <laughs> state. You didn't come now. <laughs> I am, I see folks from all over the U.S., I see D.C., I saw someone international. Um, right. It's very hot in Houston today, 104 degrees plus, Brian tells us. These are coming so fast. Um, and uh, thanks to all of you who are letting us know where you're calling in from. And uh, just a few other housekeeping items as we, get, as we begin. Uh, we would love to invite you to live tweet today. And as you see, Jennifer has provided her Twitter handle and a hashtag for today's event at the bottom of every single slide. So we'd love to invite you um, to participate with that. We also, also are going to have a very special giveaway toward the end of this event. And so I want to encourage you to stay on for the entire hour. Uh, as I mentioned before, we will be taking your questions throughout the event. Uh, Jennifer and I are going to have a conversation today, but we're we're going to also infuse some of your questions into our conversation, and we will be doing some polls in today's event, um, and so I'll be directing you to those as well. Um, there's going to be a ton of follow-up after the event, but I want to let you know from the start that we will not be sending a PDF of today's slides. However, many resources related to Jennifer's book and topic are available for download on her website including an excerpt from her book, an audio excerpt and a print excerpt. Also, um, the model for the Genius of Opposites that we're going to learn about together in today's event is available for download on the site, along with graphics and a quiz. And so you'll be able to find all the resources from today's event at jenniferconweiler.com, and I'll be sending some follow-up about that. Um, so. Uh, as we begin, I'm going to just take a quick moment to introduce Jennifer. Jennifer Conweiler is the author of a wonderful new book called The Genius of Opposites. She's also written two previous books on the topic of introverts, Quiet Influence and The Introverted Leader. Jennifer is an amazing speaker, an amazing trainer, and she's had a very exciting career. She's also the mother of two amazing daughters and the <laughs> wife of her husband, Bill, whose picture we're going to see a bit later. And uh, I'm so excited to learn with you today, Jennifer. Thank you, Becky. We ready to roll now? We are. And I, um, yeah, I think that we wanted to start with a poll. We did. Well, before we get into uh, into the content, let's and w while we're getting into the content, uh, I know we're supposed to single task, but we're going to multitask in this case. I uh, would love to uh, hear from people, and I think Becky, why don't we put that poll up now about you know, are you an introvert or an extrovert? Absolutely, here it is. We would love to hear from who's on the call today. If you're an introvert or an extrovert, now um, I don't know if anybody on the line has any guesses about what Jennifer and I are, um, but maybe we'll reveal that later. <laughs> Thanks to many of you who are answering. I'm going to give a few more seconds for people to let us know if you're an introvert or an extrovert. And then I'll show those results in just a moment. We're looking, it's looking like they're coming in higher on the introvert uh, angle here. Or Becky, did you want to sort of? Oh, you can. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm watching those results come in. And it looks like the extroverts are too busy to sit down huh, and listen today. Uh, maybe. <laughs> but uh, You think that's what it is? Uh, it's possible. So it looks okay. like the, it's slowing down. So I will um, go ahead and close up that poll. Um, thanks to all of you who participated. And I'm going to share those results. It looks like 56% of you on the call today are introverts, which is amazing. You've come to the right place. Jennifer is known as the champion of introverts. And only about 44% of you are extroverts on today's call. So we're going to have a few more polls, but thanks um, in advance for participating. Great. 
So, okay, well, let's get that back on the screen now, and we should be good to go. Uh, so thank you all, and that actually, just before we get into the sort of the meat about the opposites, so the, most of you know, or people are now knowing about introverts and extroverts, that we're pretty much around uh, half and half, 50% in the population, and it is a lot about uh, where you get your energy. Uh, are you somebody who charges your battery up internally, more like an introvert, or are you more on the extrovert side where you get charged up by people? So. Um, we can get rid of that poll. Be good yeah, to go. Here yeah, I'm having trouble with it, Jennifer. I I, I hit it twice and uh, okay. it's not going away. So I'm no going to keep worries. working on that. And um, while I'm doing that, maybe I can ask you the first question, Jennifer. Um, I would love to hear from you uh, why you wrote this book, and it's a little bit different from your other books. Well, you know, when I as you mentioned my other books, Becky, what I what I found was that when I was um, hearing from people in my community and my readers and people in speeches that would come up to me afterwards, um, what they would say to me oftentimes was um, that they were very much uh, wanting to know um, how the other half lives. And it was sort of like now we have the point at which um, we are, um, where we are um, coming to, to uh, having a, ch a chance to really understand as, as we go with the rise of the introverts, you know, and, and take a look at um, how that is all working. Um, it's a real movement. And so um, let me just go here. Yeah, you can probably so try to screen. go ahead and share your screen again. Uh, this is my hack to try to get us back to the slides. <laughs> okay, no worries. No worries. Okay, that should, is that working? It is, thank you. Sorry about that okay, cool. little glitch. Okay. That's no worries. So the rise of the introverts now is a real movement, and so I would have people come up to me and say, you know, how do I how do I connect with other with the people who are the extroverts or the introverts? I think right now I kind of know who I am, but I want to know how do I actually uh, do that and and get through some of those impasses uh, that I'm having. So that was a that was a big thing that would that would come up. Um, and so you know we are now at the point where I say we're listening to introverts. So. What's the next? What's the next step? Um, you know, I have a mother, I have a daughter, I have a sister who's an extrovert or an introvert, but yet we are we are not seeing eye to eye. We are our firing is misfiring, as I sometimes put it. Um, now, oftentimes too, we talk about you know what motivates us, and uh, as a lot of you know, or a, num a number of you may know out there, I shouldn't assume. Um, I've been married to an introvert for over 40 years, and. Being an extrovert, it's been uh, my um, sort of my incentive and my motivation to understand how this guy, well, how this guy thinks. Uh, Bill, we call him the happy introvert because you can see in this picture, this is the most he he really ever does does smile. But you know, I do learn uh, that a lot of the lessons at home, as many of us do, we practice on our spouse or we try to understand our other partners or family members or friends. And uh, those lessons transfer to the workplace. So that mystery that I've been trying to unravel, and I can't say that I have it mastered uh, over 40 years now or 42 years. I lose count after a while. Um, but it is a delicate, delicate balancing act. And how those opposites perform uh, really is, is about that. Um, and what I learned, and I have learned uh, as I did the research, Becky, was a lot around um, the sum being greater than the, the two parts. It's very exponentially different when you get those, those two together. You know, the opposite pairs require constant vigilance, careful maintenance, and balance. So really the myth of, you know, opposites attract, yes they do, but going, uh, going beyond that is really uh, takes, takes intentional, intentional work, just like in a relationship uh, that you have personally. Um, I wanted to just share with you something that you and I have talked about, and that was one, it's also, I also talked about it in the book, and, you know, having uh, worked in many different organizations, um, there was, and I love this picture here of the cat and the dog, and we should mm -hmm. ask people who, if we did a poll, you know, who's a cat lover, who's a dog litter, and these two look like they're getting along pretty well, Becky, don't they? <laughs> they <laughs> right here. Um, so they, they've obviously done the vigilance. Uh, but I worked with a woman named Amy um, who um, was at a, I was, took a job as a director of a employee development at a local company. I was really pumped about this position, Becky, and it was just really sort of what I had been aiming for. And I came in ready to just take charge and start some new initiatives, and Amy, as my assistant, uh, didn't seem to share my enthusiasm. I couldn't get the words out fast enough. She seemed to be uh, slower than 
molasses. And I was getting increasingly frustrated. And as I got frustrated, I seemed to do what a lot of us do when we are not really sure how to connect with our opposite. We rev it up more. And that's exactly what I did. And uh, luckily, there was a consultant named Pete who was available to us when we were tearing our hair out. <laughs> and he said, here's the problem, Jennifer. You're an, in you're an extrovert. Amy's an introvert. Until you learn to understand her style, you're not going to get anywhere. And you know, as a result of that, uh, I wish I could say that you know I was became a godmother to Amy's children, or we became best friends. That that's not what happened. Uh, we basically uh, didn't work it out. But that was really my motivation and my impetus for understanding more about how we could really draw the gifts from both of us and make it work. Make it work. Well, so it sounds like you and Amy were not an, a famous opposite pair in the way that story resolved. I would love to hear right. from you, Jennifer. Who are some famous opposite pairs? And, you know, I would love to also, as I'm going through a few of these, to hear from our group uh, as well, Becky, to see who they might identify or guess would be sort of introvert, extrovert pairs who created incredible achievements. Um, one of the themes that you'll see in the book a lot is that it does, I mentioned it takes work, but there's a lot of friction that occurs. One of the pairs that I, I love to cite are Orville and Wilbur Wright, and I, a friend of mine said, listen, without them, think about it, you wouldn't be stuck in the middle seat going, <laughs> going across the country. We have them to thank for that. But if you think about aviation, and those, they're obviously being the, uh, the impetus to, um, to us all flying and having that amazing uh, gift. You know, they fought like cats and dogs. They were brothers who uh, just couldn't get along. In fact, there's one story that they were fighting so much that they, they, left, they, they used to work on bicycles and craft new bicycles. They left the shop and then came back and actually had the opposite argument. So they came back and switched arguments. <laughs> mm. But watching that fire, you know, and those sparks is a constant theme that you see with introverts. And we'll talk about it. It's like they're not afraid to really deal in conflict. Maybe it's not in always the most productive way, but these two uh, obviously persevered. And then, you know, from so many different sectors, you know, we've talked about Serena and Venus. Becky, you and I have talked about that. You know, mm -hmm. not even being a tennis player, you know about them. And, you know, the incredible powerhouse, the two of them. It reminds me of sort of um, Martina and Chris Ebert from, uh, for those of you who are younger, they were, they were tremendous tennis players back in the day. Mm -hmm. I think they're still around, but they're, they're more senior now. Um, and Venus and Serena use each other as sparring partners and to challenge each other. There's sort of a competitive collaboration that occurs um, where they um, you know, actually together have won over 100 single titles and four gold medals in the Olympics, and nobody can, can uh, you know, doubt or question their incredible uh, performance. So that's the key here, too. With all of these opposites, what you're getting are results. It's not just that they get along, but that was the thing that fascinated me so much in this work. And then from the political arena, you know, we, we look at this relationship as not maybe the best marriage, of course. We've, we've heard about, uh, you know, FDR and his no, notorious uh, flings. Um, but uh, Eleanor was obviously the introvert in the relationship, and they worked very well together as a political team. Becky, you, do you know another introvert opposite political uh, pair from recent history who you can guess? Oh, no. You're putting me on the spot today, Jennifer. <laughs> President from uh, recent years. Uh, would that be George and Laura Bush, perhaps? Well, it could be George and Laura. I was thinking on the other side of the aisle. It was really more Hillary and, Hillary and Bill. You know, uh -huh, Bill being that is... a gregarious, outgoing extrovert. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, and FDR was the one who got things done. But Eleanor was really, he, I mean, incredible legislation and, and, got, and worked with Congress so effectively to make our country a better place. And, uh, and Eleanor, on the other hand, was the one with the boots on the ground. I mean, she was the one having those uh, kind of conversations that introverts have so well, one-on-one, -on -one, focused, really listening to people, and bringing that information back to FDR to then turn into some real action. So another beautiful example, I think, of, a, of an opposite pair. And I'm and seeing some in the chat window quickly. Sorry, yeah. Sonny and Cher, uh, Princess, Ch Prince Charles and Lady Diana. Some of our guests oh have mentioned gosh. those. Yeah, so I would wonder on Prince Charles and Lady Diana, who do they think was the introvert and the extrovert? That would kind of be interesting to guess on that one. Hmm. 
you yeah. know? So, Leslie, if you have a feeling about which yeah, one is the introvert and right. which one is the extrovert in that pair between Charles and Diana, you should tell us. Right, and some of our callers, which you might be surprised to know, you know, Obama is a real introvert, and he, he surrounds himself also with extroverts. So, um, And by the way, while, the, while we're on the political theme, I do have to say, before I talk about Siskel and Ebert, um, some of you may, I wrote a blog post about this recently, um, you may have seen the announcement of Jeb Bush, um, who came out and said he was an introvert when he announced with Dana Bash. So that was interesting because that was a term, just as an aside, that wasn't really talked about publicly. You know, cause so he was actually proud of being an introvert, which is oh, back to my point earlier about the rise of the introverts. Now, uh, we have a much more acceptance now that's starting to happen. So, so um, still have a long, long way to go. And the consensus here is that Prince Charles is the introvert and that Diana oh. was the extrovert, although a, a couple of people are thinking that maybe they were both introverts. So That could be. That could be. And again, remembering, too, one thing we didn't talk about, Becky, is you know the fact that it is a spectrum, and so you could be a very pronounced introvert like husband Bill, um, or you could be somebody who's more in the middle, and most people are more in the sort of mid-range, and they, they just kind of slightly prefer one side or, of, or the other. And feel free, I'm, love, I'm, I'm sure we're getting some questions coming in too. So We are. Um, Jeremy is wishing you would talk a little bit more about the spectrum from introvert and extrovert. And we did have a couple of people comment earlier with the poll that they see themselves as both. So maybe you could both. talk about how, how you can differentiate. Well, one of the ways, and I talk about it in the book, Becky, as you know, is it's, it's sort of a non-scientific way, but it's a, it goes back to that point I made earlier about energy. So if you're a person that must have, uh, must have time to recharge that battery, it's like not a negotiable after you've been with people, that's typically a sign that you're more introverted. Uh, not, you know, not always, but that, that oftentimes is uh, correlated with that. And if you're somebody that say it's nice to have that time, I like quiet time, I'm learning to appreciate it more, but I don't crave it, uh, that typically you might be energized more by, by people and being out there. Um, and again, a lot of folks are talking now about ambiverts, that you know, we could be both. Ambiverts is a term that Adam Grant uh, came up with from a, a small study that he did did of sales uh, professionals, and Dan Pink has kind of grabbed that as well. Um, I'm still on in the camp where I think we're either uh, have some kind of a preference based on Carl Jung one way or the other. So I hope that's, that helps our, um, our caller and, and certainly be happy to dialogue with you about that afterwards. It is um, very helpful. It's, it's, sure, and it's not getting hung up in the definition so much, like am I or am I not? I heard a great phrase the other day. Um, from a woman who works at uh, Susan Cain's uh, website, A Quiet Revolution, which I would, if you're introverted, I totally recommend you take a look at that. Um, Susan has, you know, launched a movement, which I'm so excited about. But in any case, uh, one of her editors wrote the other day this wonderful piece about being introverts and what, what am I or am I not is really, you know, mm -hmm. the theme. And what she, what she said, though, Becky, was, you know, if you think you are, you are. So I thought that was really an interesting, an interesting thought as well. Yeah. Um, just, uh, just to finish up with two more famous, famous opposites, because I think this kind of gives us a frame of reference here. Um, Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel were the famous thumbs up, thumbs down film critics, and um, they had sparks like flint and steel, and um, they had this real love hate relationship. And at the end, unfortunately, they both died, you know, earlier than they than they should have, really. Um, but uh, Gene Gene Siskel died quite young of a, or in his fifties, I'd say, of a brain tumor. Um, and Roger Ebert, even though you look at YouTube videos of them basically almost lunging across each other with the amount of animosity they had off the screen, what they did was they uh, put aside their differences for the sake of the show, and part of that excitement, that enthusiasm, that uh, conflict really made the sparks fly, and that's why we would tune in every week to see what they thought about the movies and make our decision based on that. So they kept their eye on the results, but they were quite different. Ebert was more extroverted, and if you read his biography, he talks a lot about uh, the way he, his personality and, and, and Cisco as well. So great, great examples here, if I do say so myself. I love, I love looking back and looking forward. And, and the last one, Becky, I'll share is famous opposites. Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg, who are really known for their close relationship where they discuss products and strategy and deals and 
everything with each other. And uh, Mark Zuckerberg even said we can talk for 30 seconds and have more meaning be exchanged than a lot of meetings that I have for an hour. So I think that speaks really well to their respect for each other and how they balance each other out so well. Very powerful so, pair. Yeah. Did you want to, I don't know if we want to chance another poll just with a kind of, unless you want to make, take away my organizer thing and that yeah, might be better. But we will, let's try, I think let's we had try a little screw up with the, um, with the slides. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure. So let's try this one. Um, All right. this, the second poll says, yeah, I have accepted right. that I cannot change my opposites. So as we've been exploring uh, the difference between introverts and extroverts, if you're working with someone who's the opposite, have you accepted that you cannot change that person, true or false? And we'll give you a few seconds uh, to be able to answer. Um, Boy, these results are surprising me because I've been married to an introvert for 22 years and I still keep hoping that he'll become more of a people lover and uh, want a lot of people around just like me. Well, I have a good book for you, Becky, called <laughs> Genius and Opposites. I have there's a, there's a loved one, it. <sighs> except, well, thank you very much. Uh, except the alien is, is what I call we're going to talk about. But, you know, you need to do a little more acceptance yourself, right? So it looks like if you close that poll now, that would be good, and then we can speak to that. And those, there's the results for you. 98, 92% versus 8%. So, so we have a very advanced group here. Now, what I wonder is if we are really actually all doing that. <laughs> so, okay, so I want to go back and I get my screen back here. All right, cool. I'll get you out of the polls and get me back. All right, show my screen. So we've got this hack. Putting on so my southern I'll... accent here. Okay, here <laughs> we go. That's Miss Jennifer. <laughs> yeah, so we're trying to, yeah, you keep calling me Miss Jennifer, that you're very southern. So let's move on here and talk about some of the challenges that emerge, and then I want to make sure we have time to go through the process. And uh, let's start with that. All right. Uh, so Jennifer, can you tell us a little bit about how um, opposite pairs or opposite wiring can cause misfiring? And uh, that's a great rhyme there. Opposite wiring causes misfiring. Tell us a, a little bit about that. Well, a couple of things I want to share with, on that, and, and that one of the, is the thing that extroverts talk things through, Becky, and uh, introverts think things through. So right there you can see that there's a disconnect. Um, if you are talking things out, your partner thinks that you are actually, uh, that's your decision, or that's, what, that's your final thought, <laughs> um, and they get confused. The introvert gets things, it, gets, it can be very exhausting. And I want to ask the introverts out there if they could comment on that maybe in the chat. Do you find that frustrating? when extroverts are thinking aloud and you're not aware that they are. And that's the key to, to let people know that, you know, I'm just talking this through, I'm thinking it through right now. Um, Emily and Dick Axelrod, who Becky, you know as well, quite well, is another um, who wrote a wonderful book on meetings. And tell me the exact name. I have it here. Uh, oh, man. This we have to stop meeting good. like this. Yes, good. And uh, highly recommend it. Emily and Dick, I interviewed 40, uh, over 40 partners for, the, for this particular book, and, and Emily is much more extroverted, and Dick is on the introverted side. And uh, Emily shared that when they were first married, because they're married and they're business partners, and they do incredible work in, in organizational development and consulting, but what uh, Emily would do would go in and tell Dick about all of her ideas for a Saturday night. You know, we can go to see this movie and that movie. And, that, and his head was literally almost spinning around, you know, telling him all these ideas. It's like, how can we fit this into one night, you know? And basically, she was just, you know, unloading her thoughts and getting clearer by speaking out her thoughts. And once he knew that, then it was cool. But when introverts don't know that that's what extroverts are doing, it can be very um, confusing. And extroverts get frustrated because they need a sounding board. So again, it's about talking about how your process works, and that seems to decompress the frustration or get rid of the frustration. The second uh, way in which, uh, or one way, in wh or a key way, I should say, a disconnect happens is the idea of privacy versus openness. Now. Introverts really do value, in general, privacy. They, they kind of keep things to the chest. I remember once hearing that it's like a fur coat and the fur is on the inside. 
So you want to warm up to an introvert. You don't obviously want to you know, start barraging them like they're on the witness stand. They like to get to know you. On the other hand, extroverts get energized and connect with you by learning about you and finding a little more about you and, and, uh, and having you reveal some what we might call free information about yourself. Um, and so this can be a source of frustration if people are not aware of those kind of wiring, uh, the wiring processes. Uh, there was one partnership that I, uh, I highlighted in the book, Brooke and Monica, who I actually found Becky through LinkedIn. You know, you talk about social media a lot, and you know, I just put a call out there on LinkedIn, and they were two, um, they were a manager and a uh, an employee work in the banking industry, and Brooke is very extroverted, and you know, just highly respects her her employee Monica and vice versa but Monica was getting married and Monica didn't tell her anything about her wedding and it drove, mm -hmm. it drove Brooke crazy it's like how could you not be talking about all the details of your wedding and your bridesmaids and the colors and and all that Monica felt like that wasn't really work related she sort of wanted it she really likes Brooke a lot but she didn't want that all mixed up with work and so they laugh about it, like a lot of genius opposites do. They kind of laugh at their differences, you know, and, and don't take it personally because they understand each other. They accept the alien. So Jennifer, and, there's a question yeah. that came in here uh, that's interesting. So you just shared about two female opposites who had trouble. Uh -huh. um, Elizabeth is wondering, you know, does it seem like there are more men who are introverted than women? And do you know if there's ever been a study about that? kind of gender difference in introversion and extroversion? You know, that's really interesting. I would say the shorter answer is no. Um, we have limited stats on that from places like the Center for Psychological Type. Um, and, you know, this, the, the information and the, the data source is very, um, I don't want to say suspect, but it's very small. The samples are small. So it's really hard to say. Um, I would say just anecdotal, anecdotally from the, some of the career fields that I, uh, I tend to work in, like in technology, for instance, and in finance, you'll find more introverted men, but, or in data and analysis. Um, and uh, but I haven't really seen any any hard research on that. I would love to hear if anybody out there, and I know we have some Myers Briggs lovers and other other types who are in the audience. Um, if you guys have any suggestions or thoughts about where we might go to find that out, and I would also follow up with you know what impact that might have, knowing that or how, you know the so what question on that. It might be useful. Um, and I guess what I want to say, in addition to thank you for all your questions, it's it's really helpful. To, to answer what you need. Just as this, we're just kind of skimming the surface here. Um, the first, I mentioned talking things out, think, you know, and, and uh, thinking things through, privacy versus openness. And then I wanted to just mention the third one on that, which would be um, needing time alone versus being with people. Uh, Steve Cohn is somebody I know who's a training sales director, and he had his team on the road, and one of his teammates really did not want to socialize at night. She goes, I'm going to my room. And when that first happened, he thought that wasn't cool and he thought she should be networking until she told him she was an introvert. And then his whole framework changed and it was fine with him. But um, again, knowing what people are makes a big difference. I definitely agree. So, um, John, so are, yeah, we gonna, go are we going to take this question? So what are three compelling reasons for opposites to learn to work together? Number one, Becky, results. Uh, one of the people in my, in my interview said, we have very different ways of seeing things, and it's spectacular. So bottom line, your incentive, in my mind, is not only to create less stress, to learn more about yourself, um, but to really create results. And that, that to me, is, is the, I would say, the most compelling reason. Uh, and I mentioned the other one being, uh, another one being that you learn about other people, you learn, uh, create, you offer the clients more uh, innovative and creative solutions. Super. So those would be, you know, and so really more and more now we're looking at introversion and extroversion uh, as a diversity uh, is as a diversity issue. Different uh, broader views for the organization helps everybody to grow, but also creates more innovation and creativity. Um, I will also say another thing, I know I've mentioned more than three, I'm going to squeeze another one in there, um, partnerships are really the new work model, so it's really a must-have, you know, and it, we all know that we gain from working with other people and the client gains as well by getting not just one solution. So if we're going to make these partnerships of all kinds work well, then we need to figure out how to work with our 
are opposite and related to that is what I said about the, um, the creative breakthroughs. That's what happens. And by the way, all these memes we have, if you guys like these pictures, um, I would suggest you go to my website on the book page, jenniferkamala.com, and you can keep those for yourself or share them, and um, we would love that, of course. Awesome. So, Jennifer, I'm going to give you a couple of more questions that are coming in. Um, Diane, Diane is wondering, are extroverts more optimistic than introverts? Diana, I would love to hear what you think about that. Uh, optimism, uh, I think maybe on uh, verbally or exp expressing it verbally, but also on their face. Uh, they might be a little more sort of what we might say sh demonstrate more facial gymnastics. Um, because introverts are more thoughtful, they, you might su suppose that they would be uh, less, um, I don't want to say, pe they wouldn't be more pessimistic, but they're more cautious or more just skeptical before they come on board fully. And, uh, and one example I'll give you is journalists. Um, probably I would guess between, I'm not basing this on any hard research, but from my experience, 90 to 95% of journalists are in the more introverted category. And as we know, that's one of the, uh, the hallmarks of a good journalist is to be skeptical, to not embrace uh, what they see on the surface. So I think that analysis, that thought, that thinking before, uh, you know, before speaking, that depth versus breadth, uh, those are all qualities. I don't want to say that goes with pessimism, but maybe just not as outwardly cheerleading uh, type of a style. Sure. That's Great big. question. Yeah, it is, it is a fun question. Nice I have more, all. but I know we have a lot of content, so um, I'll take the lead well, from we, you on that. Yeah, I would love to do the questions. I think those are probably even more useful than the polls at this point, Becky. But, so, um, so here's yeah. one from Elizabeth. She's wondering how she can better help introverted people or career changers to get out of the house and make connections that will help them further their careers. So this well, is an extrovert first, trying to help an introvert. Try to help an introvert. So first of all, you have to sort of look at your own motivation there. Uh, and so um, if you're trying to get somebody to find a job, that's a whole other issue. <laughs> you know, I mean, you have to look at what you're, what you're trying to do. I'm sure your intent is really a positive one. But once you know about their style, it may be that you encourage them in terms of the one-on-one -on -one conversations with people and, uh, and don't push them to do a lot of face-to-face -face networking. Um, and really look at what style would work for them and ask them, you know, and encourage them in that way. So I think that goes beyond introvert, extrovert, but I think your knowledge of what could be effective for them in job seeking, which is not, you know, not necessarily the, the glad handing, could be useful. I would, cons I would look at some of the articles that we have about networking for introverts on the website. I think that would be really helpful to share with them. And also in the introverted leader, there's a whole chapter on how introverts network well, and that's uh, that book um, is available as well. So Great, thank you. Uh, so sure. I would let, let's move on and just kind of walk through the model, Becky, because we talked about this is this is sort of the framework, or it is the framework of the genius of opposites. And uh, as some of you who who are familiar with my other work um, know, that I'm all about uh, practice and practical application. And that's what I like to read when I read books or listen to books. Um, so I write that for my readers. And uh, this, this process is based on the, uh, the work that I've done and the research that I did on, did on Genius Opposites and what was the, uh, the key theme here for them and what were the, what were the strategies they, they engaged in. And so we put it together as an easy to remember ABCDE model. And it starts with uh, A, accept the alien. <clears throat> and what that means is some of what we've talked about. It's saying you can't change your opposites, but you can understand them. And uh, once you do that, once you understand them, it's much less stressful. You know, it's, it, that was a turning point for me with Bill. I see it with partners all the time in the workplace. And then that leads to the real work. When you stop pushing against who they are and you give them the, you cater to their needs, not all the time. You don't try to become them. You don't push them. But you accept them. And once you step back from trying to impose your way of doing things, I know it's easier said than done, uh, then it really makes life a lot easier and it's a lot less stressful um, for both of you. Um, so. You know, there's a quote here. I'm just going to throw it in before we move to the next one. We often hate each other, but it's a kind of hatred that's like flint and steel. 
the sparks that come out make it worth the while. So those sparks can uh, can happen or can can die down when you accept. Definitely. So uh, tell me more about this bring on the battle, Jennifer. Okay, so B is bring on the battle. And what that really means is seeing disagreement as necessary between the two of you and arriving at actually better outcomes because you challenge each other to come up with better solutions together than you would alone. And I think back on one of my offices who I worked with at a company here in Atlanta who uh, we, we powered through a lot of disagreements and uh, we had to complete this project together and he was completely opposite than me, a real introvert and I was of course the extrovert um, and we, uh, we had to hunker down in the evenings, bring on the battle, really talk about our differences but more, li more so you know, focus on the outcomes and uh, today I can look back on that and what happens is you get stronger or you implode, one of the two. And in our case, it's 10 years later, we're still meeting, we become friends, we meet for lunch. Um, and, uh, you know, there were times back then that I would have never said that would have even been possible. But bringing on the battles can really strengthen your relationship in addition to getting the outcomes that you're going for. And the third area, the C, cast the character, cast the character. Know each person's role in a scenario and cast them so you bring out your opposites best in that role. So maybe the introvert does play more of a back seat sort of back office role and the extrovert's more glad handing uh, the customer. But that's not always the case. You can switch it around consciously to try to develop each other and also meet with certain types of uh, clients and to learn and grow and stretch into some of those roles. And the other key theme with that, Becky, is sharing the credit. You know, we've seen partners, right, where one kind of takes the, uh, the out there uh, scene. You know, and I write in the book about the straight men. You know, we think about Gracie Allen and, and George Burns. She was the, he was the straight man to her character, but we all know it was Burns and Allen. Those were two comic characters years ago. Um, there's many examples of the people that play the straight man, Ralph David Abernathy and Martin Luther King. Um, he was the quiet uh, sort of person who was in the background, but you know, MLK ran everything by him. If you saw Selma, he had a key role in that. So they know what their role is and they're comfortable with that role, whoever, whether introvert or extrovert. And uh, they talk about those roles from, you know, every so often. They, they revisit how they're playing out those roles. I think it's really helpful, Jennifer, to be able to call that out. I know I work with a couple of introverts, and we'll joke about it on our team um, and even remind each other, you know, oh, remember, I'm the introvert. Give me a minute to think about this. And it's very helpful. And, and you're leading into the next one, Becky. Thank you for that. I love the examples on your team of, of uh, the melange, of the medley, if you will. You know, it's, a, it's just a melting pot of all different types of personalities. And you don't, you don't come up, you do come up against each other, but then you remember that we do the fourth thing, destroy the dislike. Because this is about respect and acting like friends. You can talk openly and you can have fun. And fun was a theme that came out even from the most serious partners who I interviewed. There was one um, uh, old-time consultant. Well, they've been around a long time, let me say, and they're in the book. And the extrovert says, uh, Billy and Barbara, said, talk about, they talk about each other. And one says, you know, I have learned after all these years, when we travel together, I never bring a book. And I say, why is that? Well, I'm never going to get a word in, so I just know that that's okay. I'm not going to be able to read and... Um, uh, that's okay. I, I value our friendship. I accept our, we la they laugh about each other. And I have a slide here I'm going to show you in, in just a second. In fact, I'm going to show it to you if I have it, have it now, just to show you a really good example of that. We'll jump ahead here. <laughs> you see these two guys? <laughs> they look this like is, they're having fun. <laughs> this is Errol and Anthony. And uh, Becky, I'll ask you, well, who do you think is the introvert? And maybe we can ask our, our group, too, to comment. Who do you think, uh, they're in the book as well, Anthony and Errol, who's uh, the introvert and who's the extrovert? Um, should I wait and see what our audience thinks or should <laughs> I tell you what I think? Well, they can, they can weigh in too and you can scan that. I know you... Uh, yeah, so uh, everyone thinks, it's, it's mixed. Uh, some people uh -huh. think that uh -huh. the guy wearing the, the funny thing on his head is the extrovert. Um, and then other people think it's the other way around. Maybe they think that Anthony's hiding in that 
crazy headdress. I yeah, I definitely good. think that um, Anthony's the extrovert, though. Actually, Anthony is the introvert. Ah. And he's a real introvert, and so the people that guessed that Errol is the extrovert were correct on that. These were two uh, wonderful guys that I met in uh, Melbourne, Australia last year who run a growing company to uh, to implement those MOCCs, the MOOCs, I think they're called, yeah. And uh, and they were just kidding around, and when I asked them to send me some headshots, this is what they sent me. They have fun all the time. You know, when I met the two of them, Errol came in his, he was the, the extrovert, came in his turquoise uh, cowboy boots, and Anthony came in his in his old. He says, "My old brown shoes I get at the corner store." You know, and they just laugh about each other, laugh with each other. They are they are exceeding expectations with their company. They have a great time, and uh, and you know that's what it's about. That's what destroying the dislike is is really about. <laughs> like these, not like these guys, right? <laughs> angry there, huh? No a kidding. Angry. Yeah. And then just for the fifth one, I wanted to, to point out to you, and I'd love to get some more questions too, um, each can't offer everything. And this is knowing that each of you is not, not capable of offering everything to your clients, to your customers, and that for the true diversity you want to offer them, you, know, you work in concert to provide the widest range of options. So really the clients tell uh, successful opposites that they value those differences. They they appreciate hearing from the introvert, from the extrovert. You know, there was one uh, partnership who who taught a class together, and they said these these senior executives were who they were teaching were so were so appreciative of the different viewpoints they were getting. Um, and one was able to zero in, the introvert was able to observe and kind of pick up on things. So they were offering such a, a greater offering uh, from their course. It was, it was much more than additive, it was exponential. And so that's the beauty, again, back to results, when geniuses work together uh, and really make it click. Uh, they're not just learning and growing themselves, they're not just re reaching results, but they are helping and providing a service to their customers and clients in huge ways, and of course that translates to dollars and to increased uh, uh, measurable metrics in all kinds of ways. So I think we, we see many, many positive results of implementing the ABCDE method for sure. That's very helpful. So a question for you, Jennifer. Um, yes. Carla is wondering what suggestions you might have to help balance what seems to be an extrovert-dominated corporate culture. Well, I think that in the U.S., in excuse me, in the U.S., okay. So I think number one, it's it's really owning your own introversion, and uh, many introverts get very. Uh, I'm assuming is it Carla is yes, is Carla more introvert. mm -hmm. introverts right get very um, frustrated and tired adapting to the Type A culture. So first of all, it's it's really owning it yourself. Second of all. It's really letting people know in your group, in your team, your boss, that you are an introvert. Even ha having that conversation is difficult for people, but it's so necessary, Becky. It is so necessary uh, to start getting, because a lot of it is unconscious uh, bias. You know, people aren't real. It's like with any diversity issue, people are not realizing that they're offending you, that the way they're running meetings is uh, very extrovert oriented, for instance, where everybody's brainstorming, right, and the, the extroverts get things up on there. At the same time, uh, you know, we see prejudice on both sides of the thing, but it's much more against the, uh, I think, bias against the introverts. And so the way we're seeing that change in companies and organizations is in a couple of ways, but one of them, and the key, the key themes is that senior leadership um, is really seeing the necessity for talking about uh, introversion. They're bringing people like me and others in to talk about it and to start getting the conversation going. And then we see a critical mass of people uh, ex it really explaining what introversion is and acting in ways that honor who they are. That's really helpful. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, Kareem is wondering, um, Jennifer, if you'd be willing um, to talk about what role a person's upbringing and family structure or environment plays in the determination of kind of how our personalities are formed, you know, either as introverts or extroverts. Mm, beautiful. That's a whole nature or nurture question, Kareem, isn't it? Uh, and so, you know, it's hard to say. Uh, the the theory that I go back to, of course, like a lot of us from Myers Briggs work, is Carl Jung, who said that 
you know, we do come into the world a certain way, and anybody who has more than one child will probably attest to their personalities being even evident. Uh, Becky, I know you have several kids I do. in the womb, right? You could tell. You know, I know with my two daughters, I could, I could feel the one dancing, the other one was much more laid back. <laughs> so, you know, and then they come out and they're like that. So the genetics as well as the, uh, the influences of the family, you know, from a, from a nurturing standpoint can, can affect things. Um, I think what we have to make sure we, we, we don't do with introvert and extroversion is, is to typecast too much and to put too much, explain too much based on those two criteria. Now, Kareem, you're, you're right to talk about culture. There's culture, there's ethnicity, there's you know, geographic location, there's religion, there's so many um, dimensions of this. Um, I was talking with a radio host yesterday who was from, originally from the Northeast, and she was told that um, by her boss that she's, when she was up there that she was much too much of a fast talker and as an extrovert, and that was a bias uh, against her. But she was living in Washington, D.C., and she said it was kind of Southern. So I had to adapt, but it was really frustrating. So I think the actual uh, you know, influences that you have from your upbringing can affect things. And it's really like a lot of, it's like it's kind of green wearing several pairs of glasses. Excuse me, and you just sort of look at, you know, okay, well, which pair of glasses might I look through to understand this person better? And that's what my hope that we can be better together if we understand one of these dimensions being introvert and extrovert. Well, and that was a long, that was an extroverted answer, by the way. That was a really <laughs> a very answer. long one there, Becky. <laughs> Thinking as you talk, right, Jennifer? So I'm wondering, and uh, this question's been up for a few moments, what we can learn from the Genius of Opposites quiz. And just as a reminder, if you go to jenniferconweiler.com, you will be able to find this free quiz. Um, and tell right. us exactly how that quiz can, can help us learn about uh, our opposites. Becky, this was drawn from the lessons uh, that I learned from the successful opposites. And so what we've done here is really identify those key uh, success factors uh, for each of the five dimensions. And it's uh, a pretty short quiz. It shouldn't take you more than you know, five minutes to take. And, uh, and then you will get results that will help you um, gauge what you're doing effectively. And even better, if you can give it to one of your current opposites and see how they do, then what this really, this quiz does is provide a template for discussion uh, about what's working and well, and then what you guys can, can tweak either individually or together. So maybe, uh, you, know, you know, you know that you need to open up the discussion of conflict and not be afraid of it, or maybe you, you decide that um, you need to laugh a little bit more and act like friends and destroy the dislike. So it really encourages some, what otherwise might be some tough dis, dis uh, discussions and then finally to then take this as you move forward with either that partnership or with a one that you're anticipating going into uh, and uh, and use it for that so you can gauge yourself over time sort of longitudinally that's really fantastic advice thanks Jennifer I you're would welcome. encourage all of you to use that quiz I've considered trying it out with my introverted spouse and with my introverted colleagues um, to see how we might understand each other and work together more effectively well I'm gonna hold you to that Becky why don't we throw in another poll right now I know we have another question we wanted to ask the group absolutely uh, is that possible uh, we can try it let's do it um, <laughs> so here's one okay. Um, I'm going to launch this one. So related to working with your um, opposite, I regularly challenge my partner's thinking, true or false. I see some answers coming in. Thanks so much for participation. Um, and we'll give that a, a few moments. Yeah, and that has to do with you know the, the dimension that we talked about of bringing on the battles, which I think is one of the most important uh, elements of this. You know, how do you challenge your opposite's thinking? What do you do to say, you know what, I'm, I'm not sure about that argument, I've thought about it. And maybe you do it through writing, maybe you do it through uh, scheduling a discussion, um, but really pushing them, stretching your partner, because they're only going to come up and crystallize their ideas more. Um, I'm currently in a mastermind group, and one of the great things I love about that group is that they question some of my decisions, and I, I avoid mistakes before I go in, out into the wild blue yonder there. So 
um, I think it's important to look to do that. So how did we do on there? Wow, that's wonderful. I'd love to hear from the group too, Becky, maybe, or, or all of you out there, what, how you do that. How do you challenge your partner's thinking? Sure. Well, uh, let's wait and see if any of those come in. Jennifer, would you like me to uh, put one of the other polls up and get yeah, some other opinions? That. Let's get some other that's pretty, opinions that's on pretty that. fun. Okay. Yeah, that's um, pretty fun, and then we can throw another question or two in. I'm, I really appreciate everybody uh, staying with us for, the, for this duration. For sure. So here's one. Um, we have developed a shorthand for communicating. So in your opposite pair. And Jennifer, which of the five points does that relate to? That's accepting the alien. That that's something that where you come up with a. Um, I'm pretty much. I'm pretty sure I have to. I don't know it from memory. From memory, but memory, but I memory, but I know about is uh, is having some sort of um, a code or a cue, Becky. Mm -hmm. um, there was, um, I, and while people are doing that, I can share. Maureen and Mark were were partners that were par a pair that I interviewed, and they have developed their own language for. Uh, for communicating, and one of the things that they um, that they started saying was when they were going off track is we are missing each other. We are missing each other. And uh, another one they had is we're, I'm going on a tangent. So the extrovert would say, you know, I'm going on a tangent. And so that what was funny was uh, Maureen, who's the introvert, said that you know after a while she started adopting what uh, Mark was saying. So she would say, I'm going on a tangent. Even though she was an introvert, she, she found that it helped push her to not be so linear, you know, so she could talk. So how did we do on results on that one? Yeah, let me, um, let me close it up and share those results with, with our listeners t today. So it looks like this is about 50-50, where um, a little bit more than half the people um, have not developed a shorthand for communicating. Yeah, so I think that would be something maybe to think about. How can you, without always having to talk about it, have a simple cue or a, uh, a gesture even that you use uh, to do that? So one so, last uh, poll. Yeah, so, yeah, let's, well, let's do, we could do a last poll. We have some time for questions. Let's do one last poll. Okay, sure. I'm going to launch this one. At times we break out of our expected roles, true or false? Mm -hmm. And uh, while those answers are coming in, there are a lot of questions that have come in um, Good. and some comments like as well. So um, related to the poll about challenging, um, Bernard says that he challenges by asking questions and offering his viewpoint and opinion more openly, which for him as an introvert is not always easiest. Um, yes. And Good for you, Bernard. So another listener said that um, he challenges his partner by asking questions again, help me understand more on what you're suggesting. Um, someone said, Becky, let me just break, let me break in for a second. That is a, who is it? Did, did you see who said that? I'm not sure how to who, say his who, name. Uh, okay. The three. All right. Yeah. Um, because what I was going to say is that is a golden phrase. I wanted to thank you for bringing that up. It's help me understand. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful bridge phrase. Yeah, here's another use, one. Right? Tell me yeah. more. Tell me more. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, more I like that. to I use that one for sure. <laughs> tell right. me more. And, and then again, tell me more. <laughs> yes, you do use that one, Becky. I have heard you say that. And by the way, this question that's on this poll, uh, at times we break out of our expected roles, relates to the strength of casting the characters. So that, that would be a great way to... Uh, to kind of check yourselves. Are we always assuming, you know, that I'm the one that's supposed to work out problems with the client and you sit back? Or maybe you need to step in because you have some other ways to maneuver through that troubleshooting. I know you do that in your group, Becky, as well. You put sure. the right person for the situation when there's a problem. With Troublesome clients like myself, right? Oh, you are a dream, Miss <laughs> Jennifer. Yeah, right, right. We know, we know, we know. So, um, okay, so let's, let's take some questions while we only have a few minutes oh, left. Oh, sure. Jennifer, I did also just show the results of this poll that 88% um, okay. of the people do break out of their expected role. Good. Way to go, folks. Way to go, Simba. Indeed. I'll, I'll um, share a, a, a phrase I like to latch on to from uh, one of my old yoga teachers who said, um, Push so any more would be too much, and any less not enough. So I have a feeling that these um, that these folks are doing that exactly. Indeed, right? they're, they're getting themselves out of their comfort zone. So here's some more phrases people use when you say blank. What do you mean? 
Um, and Gary's mentioning that the strategy of effective listening and reframing the content of what your partner says is something that he oh my gosh. uses. So oh, thank you. Thank you. You know, I want to say about paraphrasing, and this is for the introverts out there, and I know there are a lot of you out there. Um, this is another golden tool to remember. You've all probably had exposure to paraphrasing, not parroting, right, where you're saying back in your own words what somebody's saying. And for introverts who like to think about things and sometimes feel pushed against the wall to respond quickly, consider throwing paraphrasing into your, uh, your normal conversation. What you will have happen is if you're, it'll help you buy some time, it'll help you really connect with people in a meaningful way and not feel that anxiety you feel when you have to come up with the next thing to say. Um, so keep in mind though, but if you do that, you're going to get the extrovert to talk a lot more. <laughs> so if that's your intention, and you know, it, will, it will be a great tool to use selectively. So think about that uh, paraphrasing. Sure. Here's a question for you, Jennifer, and I think it's a very interesting one. So the premise of our conversation today in the book is that um, introverts and opposite um, and extroverts can be stronger together and create amazing results. And Gary is wondering um, if there are any positive examples of uh, people who are the same working together. So two extroverts working well together, two introverts working well together. And he's wondering if you're saying that the mix of both is necessary for great success. Gary, great question. Uh, that could be your next book. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I only I looked just in this uh, in this res with this research question uh, at opposites. Uh, who, uh, I was particularly interested in how that mix occurred between eyes and ease. Um, I think it would be fascinating to take a look at the positive examples of extroverts and extroverts and, and eyes and you know, introverts and introverts. They are definitely out there, and I my guess would be that um, in those situations we learn to flex even more into our other side because we have to use all of the strengths uh, within us. Introverts and extroverts have all the same strengths, it's just how much they use them. So I love your question. It's definitely giving me a new book idea and uh, Maybe you'll beat me to it, which would be great. <laughs> so I just wanted to highlight also, Jennifer, there's some comments coming in um, of people saying that this has been really helpful to them because it helps them to see that they're not abnormal, that you know, just being different from someone else doesn't mean that you're not normal. And uh, so I, I, I'm happy right. to see that it's right. coming in from, uh, from a few people. And uh, I think that's, that's the whole point, that, that we can all be stronger when we work together. Um, so an, an another fun comment, uh, Eileen, <laughs> which perhaps we're demonstrating today, uh, is that sometimes two extroverts want to compete for the limelight. Oh my gosh, Eileen, were we doing that? I apologize. Were, you, were we doing that? <laughs> I apologize if that was no, the case. No, no. I think, yeah, this is, what, this is I guess, today. the the enthusiasm can, can boil over and it can be too much. I, I totally, you don't hear a lot of pauses in this webinar, do you? Uh, not um, so many. But, uh, not so much. But that's, I think it's also the nature of having the hour and trying to get a lot in and trying to keep it upbeat. But I appreciate that and something definitely to look at. So um, one more wanna... comment I have to share. So Amy just yes. commented that she wished she had this information before she lost her job with someone who was an opposite of hers. Um, and so why don't we share with the, with the audience how they can find out more about your book. Uh, the Genius of Opposites is launching on August 17th, just about two weeks from now. Um, you can find out more about the book at jenniferconweiler.com, where you can take the quiz to explore how you and your um, opposite might be able to communicate more effectively and work together more effectively. Um, and we talked at the beginning of the hour that we would have a very special giveaway at the end. So if you are willing to write to Jennifer with one action step from this event, everyone will get a free excerpt from Jennifer's book. And the first five people to share their action steps as a result of this webinar will actually get a print copy of Jennifer's book. And you may even get it before uh, the book launches on August 17th. For the rest of you, I hope that you will choose to pre-order Jennifer's book. And I'll be sending you some follow-up material via email very soon. Uh, Jennifer, any closing comments from you? Well, I want to thank everybody for signing on, for sure, and uh, helping us share the, some of these themes. Uh, it's just the beginning. I wish you spectacular outcomes as you find your genius together, uh, as said by one of my interviewees. So thank you for coming along on the journey today. Don't be a stranger, as we say here in the South, and, uh, 
and please uh, stay in touch. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jennifer. Have a great day, everyone.